If you were trapped in a bar surrounded by a ruthless gang who wanted to murder you, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the skinheads in the green room. Pat here has just woken up in the strangest of circumstances. His bandmate Tiger fell asleep at the wheel driving last night and crashed their van into a cornfield. The van's been running all night and the tank is completely empty. While Reese unloads loads in preparation to push the van to the street, Sam uses her GPS to look for the nearest source of gas. She and Pat bicycle 11 miles to the nearest town and steal gas from an SUV parked at an ice skating rink. They've brought their own siphoning kit, which is apparently something you can buy for 20 bucks online. With the gas can full, they return to the van, push it back onto the road, and they're on their way. By dusk, they finally reach town and meet up with a local punk radio DJ named Tad. He's arranged their next gig and lets them crash at his place for the night. Heading over to his place, they look around and find it full of punk memorabilia, and the group decides to relax with some beers, hoping they'll perform somewhere decent. The next morning, Tad interviews them for his show. They tell him they are intentionally aiming to keep their band called The Ain't Rights, obscure and hard to find. They have no social media presence and they don't advertise their concerts. Pat says nothing compares to a live show, so that's all they live for. Tad breaks the news to them that the gig he arranged fell through, but he's organized a backup at a local diner performing for the brunch crowd. The band is not happy about this, but with no other option, they do a set at the restaurant and it goes about as well as you'd imagine. After a miserable performance, the group is furious at Tad, and just when Tyker is about to feed him a knuckle sandwich, the guy offers them another gig, this time performing at a skinhead punk bar outside Port they're not sure they should go, but Tad reassures them so long as they keep their heads down, they'll get enough money to drive all the way back to the East Coast without siphoning gas. Unfortunately, keeping their heads down is going to be easier said than done. The next day, they arrive at the isolated bar to find it crawling with sweaty skinheads, and to make things worse, the sign outside has even misspelled their band's name. It's such a bad environment that even Tad's cousin Daniel seems aching for a fight before they're even in the door. Inside, things aren't any better. You can practically smell the BO from here. The bar manager gave Gabe escorts them to a green room with a confederate flag on the wall and enough peelable stickers you have to wonder who their wholesaler is. Pat decides to prank the crowd. On stage, they kick the concert off with a cover of a Dead Kennedy song intended to antagonize everyone in the room. Okay, this is definitely brave, but also really stupid. Only one person knows that they've come to this bar in the middle of nowhere, and that's Tad, who's related to one of the thugs here. These musicians are on their own, surrounded by people just looking for an excuse to turn violent. If it were me, I honestly wouldn't have taken the job in the first place, but since they already have, I'd be playing the hardest, quickest set of my career and getting out of here before anyone has time to jump me. Now, you can already tell there are going to be problems here, even before they enter the venue. There are clearly skinheads hanging out in the bar, and there are signs of extremist iconography everywhere. It's a clear decoration of not only their beliefs, but their loyalties as a gang. These are people willing to use violence, and by playing a dead Kennedy song mocking them, the band is giving the audience all the more reason to attack. It's too late to take it back, so we have to be ready to fight in the worst case scenario. In terms of weapons, there might be a handful of things they could use to defend themselves, like their guitars, mic stands, and whatever broken furniture they can grab. The bigger problem, however, is that there are no exits in the green room, so that means they'd have to fight through a crowd of disgruntled punks to get to one of the exits. If you look carefully when the group arrives at the venue, there are three different entry points into the building. The only doors with windows or vents are here and over here. Other than that, there don't seem to be any other ways we can climb out of the building, meaning the only exit is through these doors. The bar is most likely positioned in front of the kitchen, and since they would need to throw out garbage, we can see here that there are trash cans directly next to this door. It it could be a sign that this leads into the kitchen, so if it were me, I'd make an escape plan with my bandmates after the show to run towards that exit and head outside where I can get to our van quickly. This would only be done if it's clear we're going to be attacked, and it's the best shot we have to escape before things escalate. While the band plays, something kicks off in the crowd below. A ginger beast a foot taller than everyone around him dead eyes the band. Despite his obvious brain damage, he manages to head off in the direction of the green room while the band continues playing. When he's gone, a nearby gang member Daniel hands a secret message off to a girl named Emily. A mosh pit erupts like a geyser as the band leans into a less controversial playlist and hits their stride. It's obvious the Inked Rights love their music, and it's a good thing too, because this just might be the last gig of their lives. After the show, a heavy hitter named Big Justin is waiting with money in hand at the green room door. He maneuvers past the band to help carry their gear out, when Sam realizes she left her phone charging in there during their set. Pat offers to retrieve it for her and walks in on the scariest thing imaginable. Emily is dead on the floor at Worm's feet with a pair of pliers jammed into her head, and it's clear he murdered her. That's when a traumatized blonde girl named Amber begs Pat to call the cops. With only a moment to act, Pat speed dials 911 on Sam's phone and sprints past Big Justin who grabs for his coat, and Pat slides right out of it, racing for the safety 
of the rest of his band. The 911 operator picks up, and Pat manages to bark that there's been a stabbing at the bar before Gabe and a bald lackey can grab him. Gabe rips the phone out of his hands and ends the call to 911. Big Justin growls a half-hearted apology, saying the rival band Cowcatcher forgot to lock the green room door before they killed Emily. Gabe is in way over his head here, and he knows it. He tells everyone to hold tight and walks away, leaving the band to stew in their own excrement. Okay, our band isn't going to get out alive if we don't make some fast decisions. We don't know the layout of this bar well enough to push past the two men blocking the edge of the hallway. However, our best chance of escape is in the precious seconds between when Gabe leaves and when he returns. We could risk running into the main bar room where the next band is performing. On the one hand, the main room is very loud. They might not be able to hear Big Justin shouting for them to stop us before we're able to break through the crowd and reach the front door. On the other hand, it's hard to tell exactly how many exits there are in this building, and we don't know if they can come around to catch us at the front door. They might also know how to shut off the music and bring down the wrath of a vindictive crowd on our heads with a single switch. If I were in this situation, I would use my nervousness to my advantage to move around a lot and watch Gabe as he walks away. There is no telling what he's going to do, but once I see that he has stepped through a door that leads outside, that is when I'll know how far it is to the nearest escape point. With that in mind, we need to get rid of our babysitters. The first is Big Justin, who's standing on the stairs leading up to the green room. As far as we know, there is no exit that way, so all we have to do is get him off balance. In a little while, we'll learn that Reese is well trained in the art of jujitsu, so he should be the one to take Big Justin down. Meanwhile, the remaining three of us can distract Baldy here and slam his head back against the wall with enough force to knock him to the ground. With both men off their feet, we could sprint for the exit Gabe used and break for the woods before they're able to respond. Of course, this is risky, but it's less risky now while they're still unsure of the protocol. Once protocol kicks in, we're at the whim of the enemy somewhere we do not want to be. The situation is tense, and things Things get even worse when Gabe returns brandishing a revolver. He forces the band back into the green room as a call comes in on Sam's cell phone. It's 911 calling back after the line went dead, and Gabe steps out to talk with the operator. This is the worst case scenario they could possibly be in. Big Justin locks the door as reality hits Amber all of a sudden. She lashes out at Warren for killing her friend, but he just shrugs it off. Sam tries to think of the bright side and suggests that maybe Emily isn't even dead, but Worm dissuades her with this fantasy by yanking out the pliers buried in Emily's temple. With the cops on their way, Gabe acts fast and heads into a trailer to talk with the bar's bookkeeper, Clark, asking him to find a true believer. Acting quickly, Clark finds him two twin brothers who decide to stab each other just as the police pull up in order to cover up the stabbing in the green room. The officer steps out of the car, ordering the kids to get down on the ground, completely oblivious to the helpless band locked inside the building at this very moment. Unfortunately for the band, Darcy, the bar owner, and the world's most sociopathic grandpa arrives at the scene too late to stop all this from happening. While he supervises a thorough search of the band's van, Clark finds the band's siphoning tubes and gas canister. The man realizes it's exactly what he needs to spin a tale of lies and misdirection in his favor. Back in the green room, the band is starting to panic when they realize that no one knows they changed plans last second and came to play this ball. Reese wants to make a run at Big Justin, arguing he can't shoot them all, but the man isn't intimidated, pointing his gun at them. He might not kill them all, but the man knows he can fire at least one bullet before they're able to take the gun from him. Suddenly, Gabe and Darcy arrive at the door. To the band's surprise, Gabe calls out for Big Justin Justin to give the band the gun. Confused, Big Justin refuses and demands to know if that's a request from the bar's owner. He relaxes when he hears Darcy's voice, and the old man tells him to hand over the unloaded gun, so the band will feel safe about opening the door. This was a move nobody in the room expected. Big Justin hands over the unloaded gun and turns to leave the room, but Reese blocks his path. Pat calls out to Darcy that they won't open the door until the police arrive. Just as Big Justin is getting antsy, Tiger pounces and helps Reese wrestle him to the ground. Reese quickly pins him down with a straight arm lock maneuver. Sam quickly reloads the gun as Pat warns Darcy again that the door won't open and Big Justin won't be released until police come to the door. Okay, this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. There is no way for the band to guarantee their safety if they leave the room, unless they use Big Justin as a human shield. Unfortunately, due to the man's massive size, this isn't a feasible option. Holding Big Justin hostage in the green room secures their place for the moment and forces Darcy's gang to recalibrate for his safe recovery. It's the best bad idea they have right now. Taking the gun is also bad because Darcy has no good reason to let us have it. I'd assume he wants her prints on it to use for some other nefarious reason, but just because we're trapped in here, doesn't mean we don't have options. While Big Justin is pinned to the straight arm lock position, we should be rifling through every single one of his pockets. We should also find something to hog time on the floor, so we can't retaliate later. The other option here is a long shot, but worth trying anyway. It's important to remember that Amber is also a member of this game. It's unlikely that the dead girl Emily was the only person who knew her. There is a PA system on 
the wall in the green room. She should wait for the music in the main bar to stop between songs, and then make an announcement to the entire bar. If she doesn't raise any red flags or reveal anything she shouldn't, the girl might get to leave alive. But we all know that's not true for one simple reason. Darcy could easily call 911 and claim that he arrived in the middle of a bad situation, made worse by one of his employees' bad choices, but he didn't. He's given up his plausible deniability because there's something bigger at stake here than an employee and a band singer going to prison for murder. By coming to talk to the band himself and flip-flopping about calling the police, he's all but confirmed he doesn't intend to let them leave alive. This means we should get on that PA system and make his life very difficult for him. Amber could announce that Worm has killed Emily and reveal some secrets she knows that might turn gang members against one another. When chaos erupts, they can escape with their lives. Darcy is furious so they won't open the door and walks out of the building. He strategizes his next move with Clark and Gabe in the trailer. The old man asks the bookkeeper if they can use his fighting dogs to attack the band, and Clark insists he can. Darcy tells him to bring a couple over and to prepare to have his home used as part of the alibi Darcy is manufacturing. Outside, they find Daniel idling in his vintage car. Darcy directs him to summon four members of the Red Laces, loyal gang members who have spilled blood for the gang and who will do anything Darcy says at the drop of a hat. Back in the green room, the band opens the drop ceiling looking for a way out, but it's a dead end. Pat searches Emily's body, but only finds cigarettes, a lighter, and a cocktail napkin with the word Fleischwolf written on it. Next, they make Big Justin empty out his pockets. They're thrilled to see he has a box cutter on him, but then he pulls out a cell phone and breaks it before they can get their hands on it. This is a devastating loss. Before they can deal with it, the power of the bar cuts out, plunging them into complete darkness. This is Darcy's cover to send the crowd home, clearing the venue so the Red Laces can get rid of the band once and for all. After the audience leaves, Darcy pays off the rival band Cowcatcher with baggies of illegal substances, and the Red Laces move the band's van into the main parking lot. In the green room, Tiger notices a strange light peeking up at them from under the floor. Suddenly, the lights kick back on, and there's a knock at the door. Darcy says they're free to leave unharmed if they'll hand over the gun, which he says is unregistered. The band tries to negotiate for a phone, but Darcy refuses. The man says he'll tell the cops he arrived at his business to find a band locked in the green room with a hostage and an unregistered gun, and had to take defensive action. Half the band argues for turning the gun over, the other half for shooting through the door. Unfortunately, they only have five bullets, and Amber warns them that everyone outside the door is definitely packing a loaded weapon. Okay, this should confirm everyone's suspicions that Darcy does not intend to let us leave alive. It's at this point, everyone in the band should be scouring this room for weapons. In the back corner, we can clearly see a clothing rack made out of metal poles. We can take this apart and start tearing through the drywall to see what's behind it. In a few moments, we'll see that the walls are brick underneath, which means we can break through with a little patience and planning. First, we'll need to chisel away at the mortar of a single brick until we can pop that brick out. No matter how thick the wall is, we can chip away at the mortar to the top of the bricks above the empty space until the wall becomes structurally unsound and eventually collapses. This may sound like a long process, and it probably will be, but right now we have time, and that's all we need to test the theory. We can also use these metal poles as stabbing and swiping weapons. Stabbing will be especially important with assailants. Thrust with enough force, these poles will pierce through the soft tissue of the human abdomen. There is also the PA system on the wall. If a message is out of the question, our next best option is to blast music through the venue so loud that it drives Darcy and the other people outside. At that point, I would sneak through the venue brandishing the gun until I found each exit and locked it from the inside so no one else could enter the building. With the club secured, I would search for a landline, computer, or more weapons. If I didn't find a phone, I would strategize which of the building's three entrances would be the best place for an ambush or trap. Then, I would lay down a trap at the door with the narrowest line of sight for the person entering and lock all doors and windows except for that entrance, creating a death funnel in our favor. Without any leverage, the band decides to hand over the gun. Reese forces Big Justin back into the straight arm lock on the floor. Pat and Amber move the couch out of the way before she bends down to look through a grate in the lower corner of the door. Pat cracks open the door, ready to pass over the gun. At the last second, Amber sees Darcy isn't alone in the hallway. The red laces are with him. Amber screams to Pat that they're here to kill them, but it's too late. The red laces grab his arm and the gun and attempt to yank him into the hall. Tiger and Sam try to jerk him back in as he howls in pain. On the floor, Reese breaks Big Justin's arm, then runs over to help, freeing Pat from the terrifying hold and locking the door before the red laces can enter. They've lost the gun and Pat's arm has been cut so badly, his hand is half amputated. Big Justin rises like a ghoul behind them in the room. He clotheslines Amber with his good arm before reaching for the box cutter. Reese tackles him from behind and yanks him to the floor, wrestling him into a headlock. He squeezes, cutting off blood and oxygen until the man falls unconscious. Almost robotically, Amber slices Big Justin's unconscious beer belly from navel to ribcage with the box cutter. 
It's a brutal death, and it's clear to everyone this girl is a cold-blooded killer. The others turn their attention to trying to claw their way out of this rat trap. Amber smashes through the wall, exposing the break underneath. Sam picks away the asbestos in the ceiling, and Tiger breaks through the wooden floor where earlier he saw the faint light shining from in the blackout. Reese expands the hole, revealing a bunker beneath the green room. Climbing down to investigate, Tiger flicks on the lights to discover a fully decked out lab just waiting for a redneck to take advantage of it. The group explores the entire basement. It's mostly storage with a section for the lab equipment. A rickety ladder leads up to a metal hatch, which would open into the parking lot beside the bar, if it opened at all. Both Tiger and Reese try their hand at breaking the hatch open, but no amount of smashing or bashing will get the job done, and they leave the basement, believing this is just another dead end. Okay, none of these punks know this, but they've actually just walked into a treasure trove of potential waste out of this place. This substance is a manufactured compound requiring at least one acetylating agent during process. They should look through the chemicals in this basement for acetic and hydride or acetyl chloride. We see plenty of bottles marked with warning flammable signs as they're leaving the lab. YouTube won't let me tell you how, but trust me, both chemicals are extremely flammable. They can be used to make explosive throwing weapons, which the band could use to force Darcy's guys away from the club and give them a chance to escape into the woods. They should also scour the shells for hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. In addition to being a common ingredient in the cooking process, they are also very good at eating through the mortar used to build brick walls. I would find several pairs of heavy-duty gloves in the lab, then carefully pour the acid over the bricks until the mortar begins to dissolve. A combination of picking away at it with the metal poles in the clothing rack and applying additional pores of acid should get us through the wall. If they can't find hydrochloric or sulfuric acid, then they should look for nitric acid, which is also commonly used in place of the other two in the process processing of illegal substances. While hydrochloric and sulfuric acid can eat metal over time, nitric acid diluted in water will react with stainless steel very quickly. Here, we could definitely use this method to eat through the steel hatch blocking our escape out of the lab. What's more curious here is that Darcy doesn't just have his men enter the lab through the hatch and attack our band through the floor. A man like Darcy with access to various arsenals should be able to get his hands on a tear gas hand grenade. With it, a red lace could enter the lab and smoke the band out on record time, while the rest wait in the hallway to kill them as they try to escape the irritating gas. Finally, even if the ventilation duct is only six inches across, most vents built with some sort of code would leave at least one and a half inches of clearance between the vent and the frame. The average male chest for a slender adult male is between nine and 11 inches, and these punk rockers don't eat much. It is absolutely worth removing the duct to see if the clearance exists for either Tiger or Reese to move through the frame, maneuvering until they reach the external vent. While Tiger bandages Pat's wound with duct tape, the frustration finally wears Reese down. He decides the time has come to leave the green room, and explore the rest of the venue. They're now armed with little more than a box cutter and a metal pole Tiger tore from the ceiling. Geared up, the group prepares to flee. They rush out of the green room expecting an army, but instead, they find the bar completely deserted. Reese leads the group into the main bar, but then a terrible noise hits them. The front door opens, and an attack dog on a leash appears in the darkness like a hellhound. The band scatters, but Tiger can't get out of the way in time. The dog knocks him down and rips his throat out in seconds. That makes one victim down, with four more to go. Reese bolts for the supply room. He finds the exit door locked, but the window beside it is open. His body has barely hit the ground when the red lace lunges, stabbing Reese multiple times. He's still alive when the gang raids his pockets for his wallet and the van keys, but he doesn't have them. Meanwhile, Sam slips quietly down a side hall until she reaches the rear exit. She finds a fire extinguisher, pulls the pin, and throws open the door as she sprays the fire extinguisher blindly at her assailant and drives him back outside. He locks the door, still wiping the chemicals from his eyes. Back in the main bar, Clark sends the attack dog after Amber. It catches her on stage, tearing into her ankle like your dog with her favorite chew toy. She reels in a microphone stand, which she uses to try and shove the dog away. That's when Pat rushes over, grabbing the microphone and jamming it against the amplifier until the speakers squeal with microphone feedback. The dog darts away from the bar, and Clark follows, giving Amber and Pat time to retreat to the green room with Sam. Okay, losses like this obviously need to be avoided at all costs. Once they realize the bar is empty, before doing anything else, they need to run to that front door and lock it from the inside. These doors open outward, which means it's going to be trickier to seal them shut, but not impossible. To do so, they need to look for two extension cords, ropes, or even long curtains. Then, they need to tie one end to the center top edges of each door, and the other end to a heavy piece of furniture or a movable object across the room. In a situation like this, controlling your environment means the difference between life and death. 
I would have had Reese take the lead, holding the gun ahead of them, prepared to shoot anyone or anything coming at them from the entrance. This would have neutralized the dog and either forced Clark to flee or die. Even though they didn't know that attack dogs were a part of the enemy's arsenal, they should have each left the green room armed in some way. The metal poles or flammable chemicals would have made excellent weapons. At the very least, they should be picking things up as they walk around. They should not look for easy ways out of the building until they've had a chance to secure and investigate every corner of it. Using microphone feedback to scare the dog away was a lucky save. However, instead of wielding the mic stand as a shield, Amber should be slamming the white end down the dog's neck to cause maximum damage. We can apologize to John Wake later. For now, we need to make sure this dog can come back to finish us off. Once Clark retreats with the dog, we need to act fast and barricade the front door before anything else. Then, we need to go to the supply room where Reese escaped and home alone that b Anyone entering through the door or window is going to get glass to the feet or a flamethrower to the face, Kevin McAllister style. The biggest danger here is the exit Sam tries to use. This door doesn't lock from the inside, which seems insane from a business standpoint but also bad luck for us when we try to fortify this place. Since this door can't be secured, this is where I would stage my death funnel. I would secure the other two exits, then pile up junk to create a barrier across the far end of the narrow hallway. Ideally, it would be high enough that dogs couldn't leap over it, but with enough clearance at the top to fire down on anything that enters the hallway. With the entire club at our disposal, we can now look for weapons, phones, and a roof access that we can use to lob flammable bombs down on the red laces' heads. We could even chuck a fire bomb into the forest surrounding the compound. A forest fire would force Darcy's guys to intervene or escape and bring the fire department running. Darcy wastes no time sending in more red laces, but he doesn't realize he's sending in a traitor. Daniel, Tad's cousin, volunteers to enter the bar, and as Gabe pulls Tiger's body, the men realize the kid has died. That makes two victims down, with three more to go. He breaks down the green room door, but stops short of killing Pat, Sam, and Amber. He demands to know where Emily is, and Amber motions to the blanket-covered body on the floor. Daniel asks who killed her, but refuses to believe Amber when he tells him that Worm did it. As it turns out, he and Emily were planning to turn on the gang and run away, and that's why she was killed. Outside, Darcy senses something is wrong. Gabe admits that he knew something was going on between Daniel and Emily, and Darcy goes to investigate Daniel's car. He opens the trunk to find it packed with their belongings, ready to run. Then, he notices something worse. Tucked in the back of the trunk, there's a bat wrapped in plastic. Darcy tells Gabe it was a weapon used the year before in a crime. Daniel had claimed he destroyed it after the attack, but he kept it intending to blackmail Darcy to protect him and Emily. Instead of killing his fellow Red Lakes like he should, Daniel sends the other gang member back out. He agrees to help the band try to escape, but doesn't get far. While he's gathering loose shotgun shells from behind the main bar, the bartender steps inside and shoots him in the head. Amber grabs the microphone stand and slams the gun into the wall. Sam disorients him with the fire extinguisher, and Pat finishes him off with a deep sudden slash to the neck with Daniel's machete. Shock is starting to get the better of everyone. As our three survivors barrel into the parking lot, the red laces open fire, hitting Amber in the thigh. She drops the gun and Sam retrieves it. She fires a shot into one of Clark's dogs right before it tackles her and tears her apart. That makes three victims down with two more to go. Pat and Amber are forced back inside without a gun and the red laces lock all of the entrances to the bar. Okay, looks like this punk band's guitarist just went solo. Leaving through the front door was always going to be the least friendly option for escape. This flat open space will leave them exposed and highly visible in most situations. It's an even worse place to be outnumbered by people with more guns and more experience than you have. There is one thing here that might help them though. As Pat and Amber stumble back inside, we see there's a heavy satin curtain used to separate the entrance from the main bar. It might seem like a small thing, but drawing the curtain across the entrance would reduce the enemy's visibility of a large section of this building. It might even reduce their visibility enough to ward off any future attacks at this door. If it were me, instead of going outside, I would have drawn the curtain across the entrance and turned on the microphone feedback to prevent Clark from sending in any more dogs. Then, I would have positioned myself in the shotgun at the far right edge of the curtain so that only the shotgun was peeking through into the lobby. From this angle, we could pick off anyone who attempted to come into the front door without them even seeing us. Meanwhile, someone on my side should go behind the bar and search the bartender and Daniel's bodies for a phone. We are losing potentially valuable resources every time one of us forgets to do this. The other option they have here would be to use the chemicals in the lab to set a deadly trap for those coming in the front door. They could draw the curtain across the entrance and douse it in acetic and hydride or acetyl chloride. This offers a number of potential outcomes. The first is simply that it keeps the dogs at bay. The second is that we can use amber cigarettes as a slow fuse. To do this, light a cigarette and leave it to burn on a bar stool at the edge of a curtain soaked in chemicals. When someone tosses the curtain aside to barge into the main bar, the cigarette should hit the chemicals and set the curtain on fire. The survivors retreat to the green room again, and the man helps duct tape Amber's gunshot wound. He regales her with the epic tale of Rick Silva, a paintballer he once knew who beat a squad of marines during a match by baffling them with his chaotic gameplay. Inspired, Amber picks up a 
a sharpie and suggests they should follow in Rick's glorious example. Meanwhile, in the bookkeeping trailer, Darcy rewards Gabe for his hard work tonight with his own set of red laces. He says they will need a new house band, hinting to Gabe that the illegal substances he gave to Worm and the other members of Cowcatcher were poisoned. Clark gives his wounded dog a shot of adrenaline to send him back in with the red laces to die in battle. Darcy tells his men to finish Amber and Pat off however they need to. Now, with the rest of the band's bodies, they have enough for their alibi so the others can just disappear. One of the red laces warns they only have three shotgun shells left. The red laces enter the bar one last time, but now Amber and Pat are ready for them. They triggered the sound equipment to feedback, scaring the dog away. The red laces open the green room door to find Pat has shaved his head and drawn in his face with a sharpie. He declares himself Odin and leaps into the basement, clattering painfully onto his injured arm. In seconds, he's back up and banging his machete against everything, drawing the attention of the gang members to the hole. One thug jumps in after him, leaving the other to watch from above. Nearby, Amber emerges like a rogue dust bunny from under the couch cushions. She sneaks up the other red lace with a box cutter and attacks him from behind, killing the man. Laying claim to the dead thug's gun, she warns Pat that the red lace in the basement with him only has three shots left. She fires into the basement and tricks the punk into firing his first shot. Amber sprays the basement with a fire extinguisher to create fog cover. She dangles the dead thug's legs into the hole in the floor, but the punk doesn't fall for the trick. Pat attacks the red lace from another room, sending him back onto the floor. The thug fires and Pat dodges. Suddenly, legs appear in the ceiling hole. The red lace fires his final shot into the body's leg, thinking it's Amber. But as the body falls, we see that it's Emily. Pat goes through the shotgun, struggling to reload with his injured arm. The red lace attacks, overpowering him, but Amber sneaks up and shoots the thug in the head twice from behind, ending the fight cold. Okay, this is a fun fight, and I'll admit, I love the use of these bodies to force the Red Lace to use up his last bullets. But if we're honest, this could easily have gone very wrong. This isn't Mortal Kombat. You don't get points for extra style. Any position where you're cornered or at the risk of being discovered by someone isn't the strongest offensive or defensive position, especially when you're both wounded. Unfortunately, neither knows the rest of Darcy's crew have left the area. If we did know that, we could have recorded a quick nonsense conversation on the sound system, then left it to play and repeat in the green room to lure the Red Laces while we escaped through another door. As it is, hiding in the couch is a huge risk we can't afford to take. This guy only needs to turn his head and we're toast. Instead, we should hide in the small side room off the green room while Pat lures one of the thugs into the basement. Then, we can walk right out with a box cutter and kill the thug on our level before the other even knows he's gone. Now armed with a thug's handgun, we can wait for the red lace in the basement to turn toward the back room where Pat is hiding and shoot him in the back of the head from above. Amber and Pat climb out of the lab and find Gabe cleaning up. With nothing to defend himself with, the man surrenders from sheer exhaustion. Holding Gabe at gunpoint, the three leave the bar and set off into the woods. As they're walking, the group hears gunshots nearby, and Gabe warns them Darcy is creating his alibi using the band's bodies. Seeing an opportunity to get revenge, Amber and Pat decide to ruin his plans. They release Gabe and walk towards the road where they find Clark with one of the skinheads. Pointing their guns at them, they take the men hostage and head towards the bookkeeper's house. That's where Darcy has been arranging the bodies of Pat's friends to make it look like the band was killed trying to siphon gas from Clark's truck. Furious, they shoot the men down one by one and get revenge for everyone the skinheads murder. With that done, they survive to rock another day and can finally relax, hoping that the next gig they go to won't be as violent. But what do you think? How would you be Green Room? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.